namely the star, the Raspberry Pi. Uh, there's a short video here uh, made by Fred Sun that we're going to look at. It quickly summarizes. I'm just going to pass these two. These are two Raspberry Pis. If I can come back, please, later um, to look at. Uh, but I'm just going to quickly start this video and then we're going to go through some specs, compare it with some other small computers and talk about some applications. And that's Are these kits or like built? We'll get to that. Think about something we, but this is about a new computer that only costs $35. You might ask yourself, what can we do with a $35 computer? Well, these Birmingham residents met up to share some of their ideas. So, my name is Mike. I'm an unemployed software engineer and web developer. I'm here because the Raspberry Pi is a pretty amazing piece of technology. I mean, it's eminently affordable. It's, you know, we're talking $35 for what's essentially a fully functional computer. According to RaspberryPi.org, the idea behind a tiny and cheap computer for kids came in 2006 when Evan Upton, Rob Mullins, Jack Lang, and Alan Mycroft based at the University of Cambridge's computer laboratory, became concerned about the year-on-year -year decline in the numbers and skill levels of A-level students applying to learn computer science. The Raspberry Pi Foundation is a UK registered charity originally thought to sell up to 100,000 of these computers. Since introducing the Model B three years ago, it has sold over 1.3 million computers. The design of the Raspberry Pi is based on a system on a chip, or SOC, which is what powers smartphones. Everything that a computer needs, RAM, I.O., video, is all on a single chip. The board features HDMI video, analog sound, analog TV video, two USB connections, and a network connection. In addition to that, there is a set of general purpose input-output pins that can be used for anything from sensors to lights. And because the chip was intended for smartphones, it only consumes one to two watts of power. Makerspace and framing ample. I'm going to pause it here because then it goes into the makerspace uh, talk, but that's a very quick um, you know, introduction of what this little guy is. And basically what it comes down to is... It's a $35 computer. Um, this little board arrives as you see it. No uh, tools necessary to assemble it. Um, all you need is basically the cables to power it and to talk to it. And I'm gonna go into that in just a bit. But it is a ARM V6 processor running at 700 megahertz, 512 megabytes of DDR2 <coughs> memory. And there's a star there because there are several models of these pies. The original ones, <coughs> Actually, the original goal of this uh, foundation was to have a computer that cost $25. And in fact, they do. They have a Model A of the Raspberry Pi, which is only 256 megs of RAM, and it doesn't have Ethernet. You can buy it, but for the $10, most people think that the Ethernet is going to be useful enough, and the extra memory is definitely going to be useful as well. There is a second... Uh, version, which is the B, the Model B, and the original one came also with 256 megs of RAM. Eventually, uh, through the scale of uh, mass production, I guess, they managed to put a 512 meg uh, chip on it for free. The price remained the same. Uh, as the video mentioned earlier, they plan to sell about 150 to 100,000 computers total, or pies, and they managed to sell 1.5 million of them. So we have a 100 megabit Ethernet, two USB ports, it has HDMI, 1.4 cc basically means if you plug this into your modern TV, the TV will recognize the Pi as a device which you can control with your TV remote. It's pretty neat, you don't need any other remotes. 1080p resolution which is full HD resolution which is really the big uh, benefit of the Raspberry Pi. It has analog out and for the general purpose I.O. it has one SPI bus, one I2C bus, one serial and then the eight pins which are just general purpose. <coughs> for 
the uses of ham radio usually would use the serial interface to talk to other things or you can plug in a USB to serial um, dongle thingy converter and you get a serial interface that way. Now, this is a great piece of computer. Um, the only downside of it is really that the processor is not very powerful. Even though it looks like it is, the V6 here is the important part. This is a very old, um, very, very old family of processors. <coughs> to give you a reference, these are now used. I recently watched a video about SD cards. These little guys, the SD cards, which in fact are actually these guys. This is just a shell. So these little guys, made by Samsung, they have a v ARM V6 processor in them. They have a microcontroller in these guys, but that's a different um, talk. So you have this processor. The big thing about it is, if you look at the board, in the middle there is the processor. And if you actually look at it closely, it is stacked. Uh, it is the graphical, the, the GPU and the CPU, they're both stacked on top of each other. And the, the majority of the processing power is basically in the GPU. It's, this is made to process video, mostly. And if you are able to leverage that video processing power, you can do some very, very nice things with it. But just pure pro uh, CPU power, not so much. And later, uh, I have uh, actually Two weeks ago, on the Raspberry Pi blog, they announced that somebody has implemented Fast Fourier Transform, which we know is very useful for him, um, in the GPU. So they actually use the video card, as it were, to do the Fast Fourier Transforms, and that actually makes it possible to do spectrum uh, analyzing on this little guy. Now, there are other similar computers. And around the same time that this came out, also this guy came out. This is called the Beagle Bone. Say that again, the Beagle, Beagle Bone. Beagle Bone. Yes. The Beagle Bone is a much faster processor, the next generation. And the rest is very similar with the Raspberry Pi, except for the video output. It cannot really do good video output. However, the downside of the first BeagleBone is that it costed $90, really, uh, plus shipping, tax, etc. So a lot more expensive than the Raspberry Pi. A year ago, the BeagleBone Black came out. This guy is my favorite, my personal favorite. This thing costs $45. And this is what it has. It has a Texas Instrument V7 ARM, which is a much, much faster, even on the same clock speed processor, 1 gigahertz. It has DDR memory versus the SD memory of the Raspberry Pi. And the big plus of it is this part over here. If you're a person who's playing with a lot of low-level electronics, if you want to be communicating with other microcontrollers, uh, temperature sensors, any device really that talks on a basic I.O., <coughs> you want to have a lot of different options for interfacing. So this has three I2Cs, it has a CAN, an SPI, it has four built-in timers which can be triggered on different events, it has PWM which is also with modulation, it has seven ADCs, 12-bit ADCs for analog sampling, five serial. In general, this thing has like a lot of interface. I mean, you will see it on the board. Both sides have two rows of a lot of pins. And this thing is very interesting. This is a unique feature of the processor that TI is produced. A PRU is basically a real-time processor-ish. <coughs> what it allows you is to run real-time um, code on this little guy. And that is not the same thing as running you know, your program on Linux or on Android or your operating system because you have the kernel, you have scheduling, you have all kinds of over, uh, overhead that might interrupt your application. If you really need something that requires real-time operation, this guy has two of them running at 200 megahertz. And again, $45. And 
I'll put a star on that as well because in one of the next slides uh, I'll explain why. Yes. You, you don't show CEC on the HDMI. Yes, so. this HDMI now. This HDMI actually. So right, this the downside of this is it doesn't do a lot of video, uh, and originally it couldn't even do 1080p, 1080 uh, resolution. It could only do uh, 12, whatever it is, 1280 by. 10, 24. And a lot of people chose the Raspberry Pi because of that, because Raspberry Pi can actually display that and has the processing power to really play a 1080p video uh, file without a problem, even if it's encoded in you know, a modern code codec. This guy, not so much. This is not really for high uh, power graphics. But recently, as I said, originally when they released the, the, the firmware for it, it was only doing a lower resolution, but somebody realized that even though it was doing a lower resolution, it was doing it at 60 hertz. And when they did the math, the the clock that it has, which clocks the HDMI um, video, they realized they can actually fit a 1080 at 24 hertz. That's why I put here at 24 hertz, which is you know it's basically broadcast uh, movie. Well, not broadcast. Broadcast is 60. It's a uh, if you go to the movies, that's 24 frames, essentially, 24 hertz. So you can push it to that resolution, but you won't be able to play a movie on it, for example. And uh, again, lots and lots of interfacing options and lots of power behind it to actually drive all these things. Now, if we move up a little bit, we get to something like the Q-Box. And the Q-Box is a two, I don't have it because it's actually pretty hard to find still, but it's a two square, two cube inch box that has, um, that has four configurations and it can go this one times, two times or four times, that's basically how many cores it can have in the, process, in the box. It can have a four core, one gigahertz CPU up to two gigs of RAM, it can do a, this is supposed to be a thousand, it can do a gigabit ethernet, however, due to the limitation of the processor, it, in reality is only 470 megabits, plenty. USB, full HDMI, it does 3D, it does have even 3D, SPDI for optical out, and again, depending on the configuration, you can have infrared receive, infrared receive and transmit, and optionally can have Wi-Fi, external SATA, which essentially is an outside connector for your hard drive. A real-time clock, which a lot of people don't realize, but almost none of these small machines come with a clock. So if you want to keep time, it's actually not trivial. You don't, you know, we get it for granted with most uh, modern computers that they keep the time, but in reality, this lacks in a lot of these small computers. And RS-232. Now, the bit that's missing, yes? The RS-232, does that have the full handshaking? That's all they have right now. This is That's all they've uh, listed as an option. So I don't know how much they've implemented of the protocol. The, again, the problem is this is a very new product. They haven't even released it in the US. Um, they had a previous version just called the Q-Box, which came to the US but didn't have these um, specifications. The recent one, Q-Box I, list this as an option, that's all they had listed, that's all I could get. Uh, but I'm sure if you ask them, they'll tell you uh, how much of it they, they can implement. And the price is above, uh, $50 for the base, 512 megabyte, single core, uh, 100 megabit without any of the extras, up to $125, which is considerably more than the Raspberry Pi or the BeagleBone Black. But the major part that's missing here is all the low-level stuff. It doesn't have any general purpose pins. It doesn't have any uh, one wire. It doesn't have any uh, I squared C, I squared S. Any of that. Any of the low-level communications. You can't really. This is basically a computer. And again, it's two cubed inches. That's how big it is. So really tiny stuff. Now, you buy one of these things, and. With some of them, you can actually start using them right away, but with others, you can't. The point that the BeagleBone guys are try trying to make with their $45 BeagleBone Black is that 
It comes with a micro USB cable. It has something that I think I forgot to mention. It has built-in storage. The Raspberry Pi doesn't. So the BeagleBone Black comes with a cable, comes with storage, with the operating system installed. So all you have to do is plug it in, and that's it. You get it working, and if you have time, and if people are interested, and if John allows, I can demonstrate how it uh, works on his laptop, which I don't think he's ever seen a BeagleBone Black before. So, right. Now the Raspberry Pi, it's $35, but it doesn't come with an SD card, doesn't have power, even though you can get power from the USB, it doesn't have with the USB cable. And in reality, when by the time you buy all these things, if you're a first timer, you'll probably be more than $45. Um, you know, just a simple USB card, a four gig SD card. I mean, if, if you have these things laying at home, it's perfect. The QBox, uh, again, no power cable, no USB cable, the SD card is optional, so you really get the bare, bare bones. It's not like a laptop where you buy it, everything comes included in the bag, you just plug it in and start using it. So you have to keep that in mind. As far as software goes, the original software for Raspberry Pi, as I said, there isn't one, but they have a very nice utility called Noobs, which supports all the major operating systems, installs on your SD card, and it lets you install one of the many, many, many flavors of Linux that it supports. A RISC OS, which is specific for Raspberry Pi, very high speed, low uh, overhead operating system, which is not based on Linux. And it also runs Android. Now, runs here is like barely running. Um, as I said, the processor is pretty old, so a lot of the modern operating systems are dropping support for that processor. So, yes, people have actually gathered, they've done the work, it works, it will start, but it's not going to be nice. I mean, probably your phones are going to work much better. The BeagleBone, again, many flavors of Linux and Android, and in fact, because the BeagleBone is a more recent family of processors, you can run a lot of flavors of Linux. The QBox, Linux and Android, that's what they have on their website. Um, and let's quickly take a look at what the process looks like when you're setting up a Raspberry Pi. So this is what the Noobs installer work looks like. Basically, I don't know if you can see it, but basically when you start it, it gives you a list of all the operating systems that you can install on your Raspberry Pi. And you can select multiple, you can select several of them, you hit install, and it goes to your, to your SD card. This is the process it shows you, fairly straightforward. It's not really very easy to to uh, mess up. And when you when you start your Raspberry Pi, you see a boot screen like this for every operating system that you've installed. You have a list here: the Risk OS, which is the fast operating system; Open Elect, which is a very popular operating system for people who turn their TVs into smart TVs. Essentially, that's one of the uh, ways I've used my Raspberry Pi. Basically, install this, you plug it into your TV, and as I mentioned, you can use your TV remote. Your TV becomes a smart TV. Play YouTube on it. You can play files from your hard drive. You can play music. Um, very nice. Now the BeagleBone, on the other hand, um, you plug it in, uh, and the one thing you need to do is when you go to this website, BeagleBone.org, getting started, it tells you plug it in and you install one driver on Windows. On Linux, you don't even have to install anything. The driver allows the BeagleBone to talk, to basically get internet or ethernet um, through its USB. It creates a USB modem, and even though it has a dedicated ethernet co connector, you don't have to use it. The moment you plug it in and you install all the drivers, this turns uh, green, and it tells you your BeagleBone, serial number, such and such, is available. And on the Getting Started page, you actually have a link after you've installed the drivers. They tell you, click here, and it takes you to this IP, which is always the starting IP of the BeagleBone. It's 192.168.7.2. And you're presented with this page. This is a screenshot running from a BeagleBone. And if we um, try it, we'll, you'll probably see it live. You get a little bit of uh, documentation here on the side. You can run code on it, etc. And. Right, so a couple things. Again, 
with Raspberry Pi, I've done smart TV. Um, people have done all kinds of interesting things with them. Um, there is one here, I'm sure we'll hear about it uh, a little bit later. But it's a cheap computer, and you can control all kinds of things. You can control your coffee maker, you can make beer, you can make, um, you know, you can make all kinds of things. Whatever you can think of that needs some kind of decision making, you can cook up one of these guys for thirty-five dollars, give or take, and uh, you can make it happen. So here is an interesting one. This is an Echolink node that runs on a Raspberry Pi. And let's keep the ads. This is not an echo link node. So let me pause it. I don't know if you can see or not. So basically, this is the Raspberry Pi. Uh, USB to RS-232 dongle here. Uh, it has a modem for keying, a radio that's going to be receiving. This is, uh, I believe this is the receiving radio for the node, and this is the radio that he's going to use to show that it's actually working. And behind is his computer his Raspberry Pi actually running Linux. So he's going to run his commands, blah, 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 blah. Let's fast forward a little bit to the interesting part. Now he's gonna dial 999 star or hash, whatever, and he's gonna enter into the echo link test server, which lets him transmit with his radio. It's gonna be recorded on the server and it's gonna be played back. So let's fast forward to that. Alright, so he's connected now. And the Raspberry Pi prints everything that happens when it's transmitting, where it's not, what's connected, where is the test server, everything. So he received the <coughs> well, I don't know if you heard it, but basically what happened is the guy keyed his radio. Uh, and it says receive one. Squelch is open, he's basically receiving. The receiving stops. Then he's transmitting to uh, the Echolink test server. Transmitting stops. And uh, I guess transmitting back out to his uh, handheld, the, the recorded copy. So, I mean, this is a 10 minute video that's going pretty slowly, that's why I'm skipping. Um, and you'll have the links, you can watch them later. But the other thing I wanted to show you, which is also pretty interesting. So, this is what, this is the display he's using. Uh, it's one thing I haven't really mentioned. Both the Raspberry Pi, the BeagleBone, they get this idea from the Arduino world, which I don't know if you've heard Arduino, if you know it, Arduino is very, very popular. I mean, it's a whole nother scale in terms of uh, microcontrollers. They have this idea of shields, which is another board that you just make with the original and it enhances the capabilities. This is a LCD display, it's a touchscreen LCD display which you just plug in the beagle bone on the back and it kind of works. So there it is, the beagle bone black on the back. So he's going to connect one of those RTL video transceiver that transmit that 
receivers, tuners basically. And he's going to use that as a general purpose uh, antenna and receiver. And he's going to start it. And this is what it is the spectrum analyzer. So he's going to move around. You probably can't hear, that's why I'm speaking over him. But basically, he's going to move to a FM station. And uh, again, touch screen, this is the screen that's going around that he's using. You can see here, this is the frequency here on the bottom. It has various jumps, it's the amplitude, uh, right, strength of the signal. And all of this is free. All the software, open source, people can use it. That's what I was going to ask is like, if I wanted to build this out, I have to spend 100 bucks or so on the, on the hardware. And yes. Plus the SDR. Um, but then I can just download the software for a special Yep, yep. So here's an interesting one. I'll just, I'll get back to this in a second. So he's going to try his car remote. And he is now at, I think, three, 400 megahertz over here. And these are supposedly identical to the same car. You see one is jumping over here, and the other one is jumping over here. Both of them for lock, uh, or unlock. I mean, it's the same command that he's sending, but, you know, same remote, same manufacturer, same car, but they actually use different frequency. <coughs> and, and they both work, exactly. So, then, just in a bit, he's going to go to the 900 and something megahertz range where he's going to show his uh, home phone, wireless phone. Again, he can, you can see the spectrum. Show him again what he's got there in terms of hardware. Right, so the hardware here is a touch screen display, it doesn't have to be this. It can be any display that you can connect to the Beagle Bones. Um, displays going around. That is the only downside of this display. This is actually expensive. It's like a hundred and some bucks. But you can get a three inch. This is a seven inch. You can get a three inch one, which I believe is about forty dollars. But yeah. So the Beagle Bone says then he's got the Beagle Bone black. So the Beagle Bone is on the back. Yeah. He has a battery pack here, which is six AA batteries to power it. It takes five volts. Um, and he has a RTL something or other. It's basically one of these famous RTL uh, tuners that everybody's using to play with, with SDR. Uh, I'll, I can make this available later. Basically, it's they, they go for about $12 on Amazon, really, really cheap. And people plug them in and they start doing SDR with their computers. And they have a really, really wide range. And they can go to just a little bit over one gigahertz. I believe the lower end is like 70 megahertz or something like that. So well, anywhere in between? Yeah, anywhere in between. And it's a pretty nice, uh, I mean, somewhat flat, I mean, you, there's some, some attenuation at the end, but overall, most of the, these cheap tuners, they have a really strong spike here in the middle that just stays in the middle every time you move around. But uh, a lot of the, the popular ones are very, very, uh, so this is a digital signal here, turns on. Um, and again, I'll make, I'll make this available. I'll, I'll find out the exact model that he's using. And, uh, now, can you use this with any computer monitor, or you can? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, it has an HDMI output, so you can plug it into any HDMI uh, monitor, TV, anything. The only problem is this software expects that you'll have a mouse or something to poke it. So you'll have to also use a USB mouse. You can do that because there are USB ports on it. So plug in a USB mouse, uh, and you know you click on the frequency to move around. There you go, GSM 900. This is, you know, a cell phone. Here's the peak. So he is now at what is this, 950 megahertz. So pretty nice. Uh, this whole thing probably costs to build this whole thing probably, you know, less than 200 dollars for a mobile portable spectrum analyzer. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. So for 200 dollars, you have a spectrum analyzer instead of a spectrum analyzer for seven dollars. So, and awesome. you can make this much, much cheaper, obviously, uh, if you buy the smaller screen or if you already have it with some other screen. Yep. So, if you, can he use that for something else now that he's, he's got that spectrum analyzer? Is, there, is that a large enough uh, 
Raspberry Pi type device to do more than one application on it? Yes, uh, so this on the Raspberry Pi, I don't know if you noticed, but the refresh rate was actually pretty decent. I mean, it was doing quite a few... Uh, well, the refresh Raspberry Pi or the BeagleBone? This is the BeagleBone. This is the BeagleBone. The Raspberry Pi yes. with the latest uh, FFT fa uh, program that I mentioned, they might be able to do this. But without it, I've seen people do it, but they get like two, three frames per second. Which, you know, it could be good enough for what you're doing it, for what you're doing. But again, this is $10 more. So for if you're going to be doing math, this is definitely better. You want processor. If you're going to be doing video, you want the Raspberry Pi. That's the bottom line, uh, really. And um, questions? What other ham radio applications? Right, so applications, I showed the Echo Link node. Uh, on the Raspberry Pi, there's going to be, I believe, this D Star uh, here uh, in a second. It's going to be shown. Um, you can use it as a you can use it as rig control. You know, serial, whatever you can do with serial in ham, you can do it with one of these devices. Probably ADRS. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah, definitely. definitely. Um, if you will, repeater. I mean, it, it doesn't really whatever doesn't require that much processing power. These, even though I kind of uh, made it sound like they're not powerful enough. Still, 700 megahertz, plenty. I mean, plenty for most of the stuff that I believe is involved in radio, except for DSP and you know spectrum analyzing, fast forward transfer, very heavy math. But for that, the BeagleBone definitely can uh, handle that. And uh, quarter to nine, I do have. Again, yes. So real quick. Yep. You mentioned an Android and Linux. And yep. So you're familiar with that, but that could seem awfully um, worrisome if I wasn't familiar with it. You're not doing talk to command line stuff, really. It's all is it all GUI based? Is it all is it all graphic interface? Um, can it be? It can be, yes. Uh, so Android, obviously, there's no command line. <laughs> so if you do if you, if you install Android on one of these, and I actually had on the white BeagleBone and this display, I had an Android, and it's essentially a tablet, right? Um, works fine. You, you get the same Android experience as you're on your phone, but in terms of, you're not going to get Windows on, out of it, is my point. If you install Linux, if you really want to get the performance out of it, you want to install one of these uh, lean operating systems, which don't bother with GUIs and graphics. They really give you just the bare bones to get the hardware running, and you have to learn command line. Um, it is what it is. The benefit for the Raspberry Pi is that it has a huge community. Uh, compared to the BeagleBone, much, much bigger. And oftentimes you can get the software available for whatever you're thinking of doing. The BeagleBone on the other hand, and to some extent the Raspberry Pi, uh, can run a couple of pieces of software which let you do testing through the browser. So in the browser, in this window that I showed here, over here there's this thing called Cloud9 ID. Cloud9 is, it basically lets you run code on the BeagleBone um, through the browser. And if you have something hooked in to it, uh, you can control it. So again, you have to, you'll have to learn to type. I mean, you won't be just click here, click there to configure it and drag here and drag there. That works if you're setting a smart TV. There are images for that. You just flash this, the SD card, you put it behind your TV, and you forget about it. You control it with your remote. It's always going to be a nice uh, menu type system. You don't need to type anything. But once you start doing more of the low level stuff, you'll definitely have to learn to use it, use the command line. Not only that, but if you're doing a little bit more elaborate stuff on these computers, you'll probably want to set up a cross-compilation, it's called cross-compiling environment. In a few words, it lets you build software on your powerful computer and then just copy the resulting program on these machines. Because these machines, it'll, they, they're, the processors are okay, but the SD cards that you install things on are slow, and the combination of all that basically makes it slow to compile uh, applications. And the usual way uh, things are distributed even in the communities is through source code. So you have the source code available, you have to download it. 
Thankfully, all these come with all the tools you need to build pretty much anything that's shared out there. So you just download the code, you type the build command, and you produce uh, a working program. So you'll have to know a little bit about that stuff to be able to use these computers. And what language are you talking about? Usually C is the language, um, just because you have control over the hardware. But that being said, the Pi supports Python, supports Perl, you know, any of the higher le level languages. Cloud9 uh, that I mentioned actually uses JavaScript. So there is a library for the BeagleBone, and I believe for the Pi as well, that lets you run very basic stuff uh, like pin 9 high. And that's it. And that, that'll pull up the, the pin. Low will pull it down. You can set like a, a PWM of 125 and it'll run a PWM of 125 on that pin. So it does have some simple interfaces, but really once you start, uh, if you want to extract the most out of it, you need to write code, usually see. Yep. Would you use real-time Linux normally on it? You can, yeah. It depends on your uh, application, what you're trying to do. The RISC system is very close to that for the Raspberry Pi because it's very lightweight. It acts quickly. The BeagleBone, as I mentioned, it has two built-in uh, real-time units, so they can actually interrupt the moment you need whatever needs to happen to happen. So they can interrupt the whole OS to do it. And when, when the BeagleBone, I was thinking, because that has more you know, low-level I.O. Yep, on both of them, on both, definitely. And, um, Right, so I have, I don't know how much time we have, how much the others need, but maybe I'll just step out for them to share their uh, experience. And then if we have time at the end, we can hook up the BeagleBone to this laptop. And I actually have here a couple of temperature sensors. One wire, Dallas One wire, which is one of the many low level interfaces. It's actually three wires. It's one wire for data and one for power, one for ground. But very popular, you can chain a lot of devices on it. It's a bus and I can show you how easy it is to read the temperatures. The, if you're familiar at all with um, Arduinos, for them it's microcontroller. You really, really are at low level. There's no operating system, there's no kernel, there's nothing. There's just the bootloader. Now on these you have Linux. So you basically get the benefits of Linux and its file operations. When you read a device, even if it's low level, you just open a file and you read. Um, same thing with these guys, you load the one wire kernel module and it shows up as a file in slash dev and you just cat the file, you just read the file and there inside the file is the temperature. So it's simple as that. That's why even though the, I mentioned C, a lot of the stuff benefits from Linux and the unified file system idea of Linux, so everything shows up as a device. Is it a character device, blog device, that's a separate story, but basically it's one file which you read and you interact with. Um, you don't have to write, you know, you don't have to go and flip registers up and down and then pull the data and then flip them back again and make sure they went, etc, etc. So, who else wants to get the floor unless there are more questions and after that if there is time, I'll show you how we can hook these two temperatures, temperature sensors to the bigger one, wherever it is, and see, yeah, see the temperature here. George, Jess, yeah. yeah. Questions? Uh, I've, no. I've not ex uh, any experience in the bigger one, but I have with the Raspberry Pi, and I'm I, I've done stuff in the industrial world. Uh, matter of fact, one of the things that our company uh, does we, we build friction devices. various size stones and it's very messy and dirty and so forth. You know, we've got our furnishing machines down in our in the pit and I use Raspberry Pi to control those uh, via a, a, an Ethernet connection. Uh, in the Raspberry Pi there are applications as you mentioned, there's hundreds and hundreds of them out there. One of which I've used is, is virtual devices. Uh, the Raspberry Pi's got multiple USB ports. You can run an application that you could actually create a virtual 
USB, plug a, a USB device into the Raspberry Pi over the network on a win Windows machine, have a USB at the other end of it, and it'll show up as a device, which is very handy. Um, one of the other things, for example, where do you buy this stuff? Uh, MCM is probably the largest supplier for the Raspberry Pi. They're, they're, they've got huge catalogs. And they're, they're, they're pretty, pretty, uh, pretty well-versed in all this stuff. One thing that, I, that I've experienced is SD cards. <coughs> um, you get the Raspberry Pi 